join in the singing as Brother Rick comes to lead us. <clears throat> All right, get your hymnals, 236, 236. ingredients in that chorus mercy pardon liberty thank God all that was given at Calvary bless his name turn 500 pages more to 736 
what a wonder that Jesus loves me. You know, I, I couldn't help but think on the platform as we were singing that. I wonder if, if the Father in heaven is it's just kind of a little bit like a father-child relationship here on earth in that, in the sense that, you know, when, when, you, have a, when you have a baby, they aren't reciprocating the love immediately. You know, the father is just lavishing his love on this child. He just loves this child and there's nothing in return. But there comes a moment when you begin to see that reciprocating love. And, and, uh, and I'm so grateful that, that when I wasn't reciprocating the love yet, he was still loving me. And, uh, but, but I'm so glad that now I can reciprocate that love. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves us. Loves us in our sin. Loved us enough to die on a cross for us. I praise his name for that tonight. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Rick, for leading us in those songs of reminder <clears throat> of God's love. We're going to pray together tonight. And uh, I'm going to ask Brother Albertson if he will lead us in prayer in just a couple of moments. And uh, I'm going to share a, a few of the prayer requests in just a few moments, but I want to I want to ask Carol and Caitlin if they would prepare to come, and uh, they are going to do a missions spotlight uh, on the Melton family, and I want them to share so in in uh, prior to our prayer time, so that some of the things they may share um, could help us in our prayer time. And so I appreciate Carol and Caitlin being willing to to give us a five minute spotlight of the Melton family, and so I'm going to invite them to come right now and share that with us. This evening, sure. Caitlin and I want to share some updates with you about the Daniel Melton family in Honduras. Daniel and Tiffany are four, have four boys and are in the process of adopting a little girl. As a modern day missionary, Daniel is an entrepreneur and has started many businesses in San Luis, Honduras. Um, the businesses include the coffee business, which I'm sure most of you are aware of with the IHC, the coffee thing, <laughs> um, the water bottle company, the pizza restaurant, and a medical clinic. And there are more businesses, I believe, but I'm not sure what they all are. Um, and this is to help the mission, not to help him become rich. And I often think how much he could you know, make if he was working here in the United States, not as a ministry. Um, what a blessing he is to that country. Um, Caitlin's going to start us off with some information uh, that Daniel Melton sent to us. A few exciting things are happening in Honduras that the Meltons are excited about. They have a new doctor working in the clinic. They say God sent her to them just in time and that she is helping with so many things, including the things the government is requiring of their clinic. They are excited that progress is continuing to be made on the clinic and the plaza, and they have also had several people brought into their lives that are helping them meet the new regulations that the government is demanding of them. They say God is good to have these people already in place, and that Daniel's motto in life is, it all depends on who you know, which is proving true. Some of these people are friends of a friend, and one inspection was able to be completed in a few days because of this instead of six months. And some of the challenging things that um, are happening in Honduras are that they need permissions to have the clinic running legally so that they have to meet their new requirements. It is also a challenge finding the correct personnel for the clinic. Um, as the government puts more regulations on the clinic, they are requiring more doctors and special specialty personnel. They want to have the clinic, want the clinic to have a pediatrician and a gynecologist. With all the new regulations they have to put on the clinic, it has changed many things, including the layout of the building um, and also paying for more legal work. The original price to complete the, the project keeps changing, but God knows this. They are trusting him to provide. The Meltons have requested prayer that God would guide them to the people they need to fulfill the needs of the clinic. They also need wisdom and to know God's will in the midst of all of this. They also asked us to pray about their adoption and that things are being going to be finalized before um, December. If not, they have to start paperwork in the United States. 
The Meltons are not sure why it seems that the government is trying to take over the clinic. There are many changes to make um, health care facilities function better, but they have been told that the government is not treating them fairly. The Meltons have heard rumors as to why they are being so rigid, but do not know if it's true or not, and the government is not trying to take over the clinic, but they're just trying to control it. This was something that interests me because um, there are several uh, kids that were adopted in my extended family. The adoption um, was something I wanted to know about personally, and I don't have a lot of information, but this did help me. Um, the Meltons have been told their papers for adoption are ready to go to the judge. I'm, I'm guessing this little girl might be three years old now. I'm not sure exactly. I've only seen a picture of her and not her face. You know, obviously they can't, you know, show her face but, um, to the public. Um, if that is the case, if they have to go, um, go to the judge and he finds nothing wrong, he has only to set the date and final, finalize it all. It can take three weeks or it can take six months for him to set this date. Please pray that the date is before December. If not, the Meltons will have to start the paperwork in the United States all over again. And um, so once the adoption is finalized, they will return to the United States to finalize the U.S. citizenship for her. And thank you. Thank you, Carol and Caitlin, for that wonderful update. And so let's be praying for, for the Melton family. And, uh, I, you know, I think, I think sometimes we might get a little annoyed here in the U.S. about the efficiency or lack of efficiency, like the Bureau of Motor Vehicles and all of that that can provide for us. But I think we have no clue what it's like, <laughs> really, when it comes right down to it. Uh, Sister Sutherland was just talking to us on Sunday and she was trying to get her, her license and uh, tell us all about the, the, the rigmarole the BMV was giving her and, and so forth. And I know that those are challenging, but I think you, you, you uh, multiply that by tens and all that, and you have the, what it's like overseas, and uh, not just overseas, but across the borders. And so we want to pray for the Meltons in regard to this adoption that uh, God's will would be done. If he would see fit, it would speed up the process, as well as the, the regulations that are, um, that are coming down the pike for the, for the clinic and so forth. So let's, let's pray especially for them. And I know the, the Meltons have a couple of sons that are, uh, are at GBS, and uh, so I know their family is kind of scattered a little bit right now, but let's just pray the Lord would uh, give them the, the help that, that they need. And I know this isn't the, uh, the, the spotlight of our other missionaries, but let's pray for the Crestman family as well. And the Hopkins, the Lord would give them a special help in all of their, their ministry endeavors. <clears throat> we want to remember some of the other requests uh, that we have been mentioning. Let's continue to remember Sister Albertson and uh, Sister Cooper um, need our continued prayer. So let's remember them as we pray. So good to see Junior Yeary here. Let's continue to pray the Lord would um, give him a physical touch and to give direction in that. We also want to pray for uh, Robin Head. Uh, Robin, uh, was, I was in contact with her last week and she was here on Sunday. I was grateful to see that, but just several things going on in her world that, that uh, that's making it difficult. So let's pray for Robin tonight as we pray. I want us to pray for uh, Reese Litchfield. As I understand it, they're, um, they are being told that it's best for them to get a second opinion. Um, just kind of uncertain about why why one doctor would, would say you need to hop on one knee uh, when, when you've been having issues with the other knee. If, if the medication has affected both, both legs, why, why would you hop around for a year and a half on, on a good knee? And so anyway, they are being challenged to, um, to check out a second opinion. So I want us to help the, the Litchfields pray uh, for Reese as well as uh, housing that, that they need. Let's pray, let's pray for them uh, this evening. Continue to pray for uh, Sister O'Donnell's mother, Sister Robbins. Let's pray for her. And um, let's see here, any other request that we might need to mention? I'm just looking through the, the online directory. Let's continue to pray for Brother Ralph Wilmhoff as well. Lord, we give him a special, uh, special touch as he recovers from surgery. Continue to pray for the wits. I know that they need our, our special uh, prayers. 
challenging situation. The Lord knows all about that. So let's pray, pray for them tonight. Are there any other spoken requests that you would like to mention as we pray? Yes, Sister Albertson. All right, let's remember Sister Sankey. Not been feeling well. Let's pray for her. The Lord would give her a special touch. <clears throat> All right, let's remember Brother Russell as we pray tonight. Okay. Let's remember these, these requests, Rebecca Mann, physically, as well as these that our church is impacting uh, in the bus ministry. So let's pray for them. I also want us to pray, especially for the Zabos, and I know that they, they are carrying a heavy load with their son, Jonathan, and so I want us to help, uh, I want us to help carry their load, and uh, you know, there are so many needs, so many concerns but God knows all about them doesn't he and what a privilege it is for us uh, to help bear one another's burdens and so uh, I hope you'll join me in doing that tonight as we pray any other request any other spoken request yes Sherry all right let's remember this need Lord is able to give special help there. Continue to pray for Shemira. The Lord will give her special help. Amen. Remember the spiritual needs connected to this church and in our community. We believe Jesus is the answer, don't we? We, we sure do. He's the answer. And uh, let's pray that these individuals will recognize that Jesus is the answer, that what they are pursuing after isn't going to satisfy. So let's pray for these spiritual needs. Maybe you have unspoken requests you'd like to mention. Buy an upraised hand. Many, many needs represented by those uplifted hands. Brother Winkler. All right, let's help the Winklers pray. The Lord will give them special help as they visit Shemika. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I want to challenge you as we pray tonight. This isn't, this isn't a vain exercise, is it? This isn't just filling slot and uh, time in a church service. But uh, this is an opportunity for us to, to, to bring our burdens to the Lord and an opportunity to leave them there. Isn't it, isn't it easy to bring it to them and then continue to carry it? Well, it's our privilege to bring them to the Lord and leave them at His feet. And let's, let's pray together tonight that God's will be done at each of these requests this evening. All right, let's help the Winklers pray in regard to this continuance in court. Amen. All right, well, let's kneel together, and uh, Brother Albertson will lead us in prayer. If you're able to kneel, we encourage you to do so. If not, we certainly understand. But uh, let's pray together as Brother Albertson leads us tonight. Let's remember these requests as he does so. Oh, Lord, we bow in your presence tonight. We thank you for the opportunity that we have of coming into your presence. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. We thank you, Lord, that we're not coming to you tonight to inform you of any of these needs, any of these requests that were made mention. 
We thank you, Lord, that you already see, you already know. We thank you that you care and you're concerned. Oh, Lord, we thank you that we can bring them to you. As we bring our requests to you, we want to pause and just say thank you. Thank you for what you've already done. Thank you for the answers to prayer you've already answered. Thank you for the work that you're already doing in these requests. While, while your work may be hid from our eyes and we don't see any progress in, in some of the requests that maybe we're praying about, we thank you, Lord, that that does not mean that you're not working. It does not mean that you're unconcerned. It does not mean that you're inactive. But we thank you, Lord, that in what we see or what we don't see, we have the confidence that you're a God that's at work, a God who hears, a God who answers. We thank you that you've told us to come boldly to your throne of grace, that we might receive mercy, grace and mercy in our time of need. We thank you that you hear us, your ear is tuned to the cry of the righteous. We thank you, Lord, that you said, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which you know not. We thank you, Lord, that we can, we can bring these requests to you, Lord. You know every need, you know every circumstance, you know every detail of every need. We thank you, Lord, that you're a God who knows, a God who cares. We're asking, oh God, that your will would be done, that your will would be accomplished. We pray for spiritual needs connected to this church and in our community. We pray, oh God, that your will would be done, that you would continue to speak, continue to draw, make hearts continue to respond to your spirit, we pray. We pray for physical needs, Lord. You know every single one of these, Lord, connected to our church with physical concerns and physical needs. <clears throat> we pray, oh God, that you would give help. Oh, we pray for financial and emotional, relational needs. We pray, oh God, that your will would be done. We pray that you would give us your divine help. Accomplish your plan and purposes in our lives. We Lord, we pray that you will help us in this service. Your will would be accomplished. And we pray we're trusting you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Albertson, for leading us in prayer tonight. And I challenge you to continue to remember these requests uh, throughout, throughout the week. Well, we ought to have several testimonies, and uh, before we do that, let me just mention a few announcements uh, off of the e-bulletin. Don't forget that on September the 15th, several things are taking place, and uh, that will be Missions Day, all day on September the 15th, and then uh, Sunday evening at 515, we'll begin Junior Church Plus and Faith Builders Plus, put a plug in for that on Sunday. And uh, I encourage those that are in those age brackets to participate in those. Also, um, September 17 to 19 is Men Arise. And we've been announcing this for some time, or at least we announced it previously and kind of let it lie dormant for, for a while. But it is coming up rather quickly, a couple weeks from now. And uh, several of you have signed up to participate and we're looking forward to that conference. But if anybody has not signed up yet and plan to participate or plan to go, uh, you have not signed up yet, we encourage you to do it. You can sign up at uh, menarise.com. And uh, whether, if you're going with our church group, you still need to sign up just to make sure they have a place for you. And then down in the registration, there's a place where you can sign up if you want to stay with the Burlington people. So you can just put Burlington Bible Church in that spot about, um, about lodging. And uh, we are planning to take the bus out there. And so we will be giving you a time, uh, a load time and a departure time in the near future. But I encourage you to be a part of, of uh, Men Arise if, if, uh, if you're a man and you're interested. All right. Uh, don't forget September 21st is the Youth Car Wash. And uh, that will be from 11 
to three. We've adjusted the time. At one point it was 11 to four, uh, but that's a long time to do a car wash. So uh, we, uh, we have uh, shaved off an hour at the end, 11 to three. And let me just mention this. Um, after our summit youth encounter, uh, which was a wonderful success, we're so grateful for what God has done for us. Obviously an event like that um, always takes funds. And, uh, and so obviously one of the big expenses was food. And, uh, and so anyway, we are, uh, the, the young people have done a fundraiser back in March and uh, the, the youth involvement service provided an offering for that, but there is a shortfall of expenses of covering that event. And so the youth car wash is an attempt to help uh, bring up the discrepancy between uh, what we've spent and what we've brought in. So, so if, just so you know ahead of time that that's what this, uh, the car wash, of course we do that, uh, the car wash every year, but this particular car wash is supposed to, uh, the funds brought in will help us with that, that expenditure. And so I want to encourage you to, um, get your car extra dirty or whatever and uh and support the youth department and i know that will be a great a great blessing all right i think that's uh let's see here there was a couple of donated items should i mention that a couple of donated items that were uh, from a bus bus mom um contacted sherilyn and there's a, a jogger stroller and some other things and so if uh some of you uh, with that age bracket, kids would like to take a look at that. Sherilyn can help you with that, and uh, I'm sure that that might be a blessing to you. All right, I think that's all the announcements for tonight, and uh, we ought to have some testimonies. Anybody come to church with a testimony that you're ready to share? Or am I going to have to prime the pump? All right, right here. Go right ahead. Start us off. Amen. Wonderful. Amen. Praise God. All right, right back here. Wonderful, good, good testimonies. That's great. He's always with us. Good, Marshall. Praise God, Marshall. Amen. Good testimony. All right, Shemira. You love Jesus. Good. Thank you, Shemira, for that testimony. Amen. All right, somebody else. Ready to give God praise. Now, if I, were, if I were Eli and I were doing testimonies, I would say I need this and this and this. I'm not going to do it yet. I'm just going to wait a little bit and see who testifies. All right, Nancy. Praise the Lord. Being justified by faith, we have what? Peace with God. Hallelujah. Peace the world can't give and the peace the world can't take away. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. All right. Who's next? Praise God, Randy. <clears throat> Amen. Praise God. Amen. 
Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. So good to have you here tonight. Amen. All right, Isaac. Praise the Lord for a present update victory. Praise God. Amen. Praise God, Isaac. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> well, we do we ever get tired of hearing it said that it's a relationship? We say it over and over, but it really is, isn't it? You fall in love with Jesus and then you just walk with him and do what he tells you to do and don't do what he tells you not to do. It's a relationship. And I praise God for that wonderful relationship. He walks and he talks with me. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Well, if you have your Bibles, let's turn in them to Revelation chapter 3. If you didn't get your testimony in, come back next week. And uh, we'll, we'll put it in next week. Revelation chapter 3, the final lesson in our Wednesday evening series entitled Listen Up is the final church Jesus addresses in the book of Revelation. Passage is chapter 3, verses 14 to 22. Passage is probably one of the most preached passages in the book of Revelation, is my guess, and uh, certainly a, a passage that we can glean some from. We want to look at the important truth Jesus wanted to communicate to the church through His words, uh, the similar words that are tying, uh, that provide the basis for this series, Jesus says in verse 22, he, has, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Before we, we submerge ourselves in the passage, by, by way of introduction, I want to uh, make a couple of quick observations. Number one, the church at Laodicea possesses the distinguishing characteristic as the only church who receives no praise or commendation from Jesus. There is nothing good Jesus mentioned in this letter concerning the church. Now, all the other churches that had received words of condemnation from Jesus had at least some form of praise from Jesus. So there were certainly churches that had issues, but there were, they were, uh, I don't know that I should say they balanced out, but, but Jesus did offer some words of commendation for them as well. But the church at Laodicea, Jesus has no words of commendation for them. Uh, how devastating that would be, certainly. But the second observation is Jesus' letter is the second letter sent to the church at Laodicea. How many knew that the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the Laodiceans? Anybody? I'm sure some of you did. We learned this in Paul's epistle to the Colossians in chapter 4, verses 15 to 17. If you were to scan these verses, you would notice a couple of things. Verses 15 and 16 tells us that there were believers in Laodicea. And Paul gives us uh, two indicators. He calls them brethren in verse 15. And then in verse 16, he references the church of the Laodiceans. And then in verse 16, Paul essentially says to the church, I want you, Paul's writing to the church at Colossians, at Colossae, and he says, I want you to swap letters is what he says. The church in Laodicea needs to read the epistle to the Colossians. And the church at Colossae needs to read the epistle that was written to the church at Laodicea. Now, this would not have been a very difficult assignment. These two churches were only about 11 miles apart. Now, obviously, we don't have the letter that Paul wrote to the Laodiceans. Wouldn't it be fascinating for that to be discovered? I love, I love when artifacts come out that support Scripture. Of course, we already believe the Scripture, right? But I love it when all these artifacts come up and and uh, give, give substantial uh, meat to the fact of that the word is true. I would love to find out what Paul wrote to the Laodiceans. But perhaps the most interesting thing is what Paul says next in, in Colossians 4. In verse 17, Paul mentions a pastor by the name of Archippus. 
Some believe this man to be a pastor at Colossae in the absence of Epaphras, but it's also possible this man was a bishop in Laodicea. The third century work called the Apostolic Constitutions mentions that the first bishop of Laodicea was Archippus. So if this is a reference to the bishop in Laodicea, the wording here that Paul uses could indicate a lack of spiritual leadership 30 years prior to Jesus' letter. Paul tells the church at Colossae to tell Archippus, keep an eye on the ministry that God has given you and fulfill it. Well, perhaps this is a possible interpretation rings with speculation and assumption, but I think one thing we know is a church with no commendations does not happen overnight. This church had been on a downward trajectory for some time. So let's begin again, as we have in all of these, with the context. Who is the author? Who is the recipient? Well, notice first the church. Laodicea was located around 40 miles southeast of Philadelphia, which was the last church we studied. It was founded by Antiochus II. He was named after his wife, Laodice. Have you men named a city after your wife lately? (laughs) You'll get right on it, right? (laughs) The city was both a commercial and administrative city, primarily because of its location where three important roads converged. As a result of these roads that came through the city, many goods and services were offered to its residents. This perhaps meant that the residents here would have been offered the newest merchant items to hit the market. And the townspeople would have had the money to buy these new items. It was a wealthy city. In fact, it housed the regional banking center. It's fascinating that when Cicero, the Roman philosopher and politician, traveled in Asia Minor, it was here that his letters of credit were were cashed in Laodicea. Their wealth was impressively displayed when a destructive earthquake hit the city and they turned down Roman government subsidy and rebuilt it with their own funds. No, we don't need Rome's support. We don't need your money. There was a sense of independence, a sense of self-sufficiency. The city was known for its manufacture of soft black wool clothing. It was home to a well-known medical center, which was famous for two things, ointment for the ears and ointment for the eyes. So if we were to take all of these things and combine them together, together, you come up with a pretty clear picture of the people of Laodicea. They were wealthy, they were healthy, they were fashionable, and they were independent. And it was to the church living within this type of culture to which Jesus himself speaks. So we have the church. Secondly, notice the Christ. How does Jesus sign his name as the author of this letter? Verse 14, if your Bibles are open, Revelation 3, verse 14, Jesus says, these things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Jesus doesn't mask his identity to the church. He proclaims it with three descriptions. First, he calls himself the Amen. Jesus, identifying himself as such, is essentially saying, you can rely on my words. He is the Amen. The second statement Jesus makes is similar in nature. He calls himself the faithful and true witness. What happens when someone is a false witness in a court of law? They're not telling the truth, right? The words that they are saying cannot be trusted. The false witness. And so when Jesus says that he is the faithful and true witness, it simply means that he is the one whose words can be completely relied on. So in both of these statements, the amen and the faithful and true witness, Jesus is basically communicating to the church at the outset of this letter You can rest assured that the words that I'm going to be sharing with you, as difficult as they may be, you can rest assured that they are absolutely true. The third and final statement, Jesus says, he's the beginning of the creation of God. Now, 
Some have used this statement and have, have taught heresy by indicating Jesus was not eternal, but rather created by God. But we know from Colossians and the Gospel of, the Gospel of John that Jesus was the one who spoke in creation. This, the phrase used here in verse 14 simply means that Jesus is the origin or the beginning of creation. So now let's quickly look at the content. I, I know that many, many preachers have dived deep in this passage, and there's, there's a place for that. And I know we can't do that in the short time we have. But let me offer, uh, in passing, several headings that can fall under, under the content. Notice from verse 15, God's assessment. Jesus says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. Very quickly, the church of the Laodiceans had heard from God. It heard His assessment on them. From the same verse, we read of God's desire. Jesus said, I wish you were cold or hot. Jesus preferred them to be one or the other. And thirdly, we read of God's disgust. Because they are lukewarm, Jesus says, I will spit or I will vomit you out of my mouth. The fascinating thing about this illustration about cold and hot is that Laodicea was in a geographical location that by the time cold water flowing from somewhere else reached them or the boiling springs, the hot water, by the time it flowed the aqueduct and came to Laodicea from either one of those places, by the time it reached them, it was lukewarm. And he says, this is disgusting to me. I wish you were one or the other. But you're neither. You're lukewarm. And I will spew you out of my mouth. So we have God's assessment, God's desire, God's disgust. Then we notice in verse 17, the church's deception. Jesus tells them, you say one thing about yourself, but I'm telling you another thing. The truth is, and I want you to hear me on this, the truth is mankind can be deceived into thinking they are okay spiritually. Verse 18 tells us of God's direction. God tells them what to do about their lukewarmness. I'm so grateful that we have a faithful God who does that. He doesn't leave us to wander off, to damn our souls. But he does everything in his power to stand in the way and wave his arms, so to speak, and say, you know, you've said this about yourself, but I want to tell you the truth about it. And then he gives them the direction. The faithful God who has pegged their spiritual condition gives them the remedy. I'm so grateful that we all have experienced that. Then finally, in verses 19 and 20, we see God's compassion. He loves, he rebukes, he chastens, he stands at the door waiting for an invitation. So that's the content. Now, what is the call? Let's wrap it up with the call. What is it that Jesus wanted the church then and the church now to understand. What is, what's the important truth at hand that would compel him to say, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. I know if we were to open it up, there would be pro probably several things that could be suggested. Probably all of them could be right. But let me just mention three things. First of all, perhaps Jesus could be saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. There is a danger of spiritual deception. You can think one thing about your spiritual life and God think another about it. So what should that create in us? What, what should our response be to acknowledging that truth? It should behoove us to seek God's assessment of our own spiritual lives. We shouldn't go on thinking everything is okay. We need to stop and say, search me, O God, and know my heart. Take advantage of what, what Paul challenges us to do um, in 1 Corinthians where he says, examine me whether I am in the faith. We need to take advantage of those opportunities because we may think one thing about ourselves and God think another. And I want to tell you, of those two, God's right. His assessment is always right. So he could be saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. There's the danger of spiritual deception. Secondly, 
Jesus could be saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. There is a remedy for spiritual restoration. I believe Jesus was telling the church at Laodicea, there's nothing good about you right now. Nothing good. But I want you to know there's hope. Can't you, can't you see that in the passage? Isn't that what, what Jesus is offering them? He said, I stand at the door and knock. If in the honest assessment of your soul, when you lay your soul out before Almighty God, and something needs addressed, Jesus says there is a solution for the condition of the human heart. <clears throat> there is always a solution. There is always a remedy. Thank God there is. Finally, Jesus could be saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. There is a relationship in spiritual reconciliation. Jesus says uh, in verse number, is it 21? No, verse number 20. I will sup with him and he with me. A beautiful reconciliation awaited the church at Laodicea if they would simply respond to the invitation that Jesus provided. Is there any chance someone here on this Wednesday night needs the truth that you may be deceived right now and thinking you're okay? What about the re reminder that there is a remedy if you realize you're not where you need to be? There's a solution. God doesn't leave us without hope. And then maybe someone needs to know that a reconciliation is possible. Could it have been maybe somebody of the church of Laodicea said, I've, I've gone too far. I've, I've, there's no hope. But Jesus offers words of hope and of reconciliation and he does it for us too. In closing, this is the closing of the series after 11 Wednesday night services. Let me offer this closing statement. The church collectively is representative of the church individually. The church collectively is representative of the church individually. So with that being said, if you find yourself in a spiritual condition of any of these churches where God has given words of correction, maybe you would say, well, actually, I find myself in Sardis or I find myself in, in one of these other churches. If you find yourself, your spiritual condition, that you're in one of these churches where God gives words of correction, my challenge to you is follow the prescription he gives. Follow the antidote that he gives. Jesus stands ready to restore. And I want to remind us that Jesus is more interested in reformation than in desertion. God is more ready to run toward you than he is away from you. In fact, it's more like you running from him is the actual. But God is more interested in reformation than in desertion. So if you follow the prescription... A beautiful relationship can be followed. Or if you find yourself, maybe you say, as I've opened myself up to the control of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus only, have words, only has words of commendation for me. The challenge for us, as it was in a couple of those churches, is to remain faithful. Remain faithful. Have you ever, have, have you ever seen a sibling rivalry or maybe even a parent child situation where the child doesn't want to hear and they plug their ears anybody guilty of doing that <laughs> may god give to all of us as his people the desire to have unplugged ears to really hear what he has to say to us I, i'm reminded of a story that maybe i've told it here but story of Raymond Shreve. Uh, he would be playing outside and when he knew it was about time for his mother to call for him to come in to eat supper, he would grab a can of rocks and just shake it. 
so it drowned out the, the noise of his mother. And so when he would come in, she said, didn't you hear me? He said, no, I didn't hear you. <clears throat> Talk about deception. <laughs> but I want to challenge all of us to figuratively say, I am not going to have plugged ears when it comes to what the Spirit has to say to me. <clears throat> I want to know what he has to say to me. I need to know the truth about my spiritual life. And I want to go to heaven. And so I want to take the steps, the prescription that he lays out for me. But if we're continually doing this and don't want to hear what he has to say, friend, there's no spiritual success down that road. Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. So my challenge to all of us is he will be faithful he will speak. May God give us ears to hear. Amen. Let's stand together. Thank you for your attention and your attendance tonight. Oh God, would you grant each of us ears to hear what you're saying to us? We know that we are all at different journeys in our spiritual, different stages in our spiritual journey. And while that might be overwhelming to us, we don't have to navigate other people's spiritual journey. And none of it's confusing to you. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would help all of us to just simply have ears to hear what you're saying to us. And then give us the will to follow your instructions so that we can be your people and we can be the church you want us to be in 2024. Take this truth, apply it to our hearts, and we'll praise you in Christ's name. Amen. You are dismissed. God bless you.